everybody's very welcome to Clay Arts Centre tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're very, very happy to have you all here and uh, to celebrate this exhibition that we have in the gallery right now, A Taste of Home, which was juried by Julia Galloway. And Heidi's just getting on. She's joining us too. Hi, Heidi. Thank you. So um, I'm going to hand things over, just introduce our panel very quickly. Uh, we have Wade MacDonald, uh, who is at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And Wade was a 2018 Ansika Emerging Artist. I think I got that right, Wade. Uh, Jennifer Rossiter is at St. Petersburg, Florida. Her studio is at the Maureen uh, Center for uh, Clay Studio. Claire Micklin is at Black Cat Pottery in Chicago. And Heidi McKay Casto is at Iowa City. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Wade first. And you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Wade. All right. Can you all see that? Everybody see that? Yes. OK, great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Wade McDonald. Uh, I teach here at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Uh, I'm originally uh, from Michigan, and my parents uh, live in Kalamazoo, Michigan, um, which is about 30 minutes, 45 minutes from Lake Michigan. Um, and we are, Kalamazoo is kind of, its claim to fame is that it was the, um, the uh, original spot where Gibson guitars were manufactured and it's the home of Bell's beer and so we I think in that city we have um, many many microbreweries so it's like a, a, a beer drinkers uh, heaven there a little bit but we also have a really strong ceramics community um, there are several artists who have uh, kind of made their <laughs> their home there. Um, Shea Church is there with uh, uh, grayling ceramics. Um, and there are several universities and they're all kind of, they all have fairly strong ceramics programs. So I, I came up there, I taught at um, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts uh, and before going to grad school at Michigan State University. And um, and then eventually coming to Alabama. So um, I have a lot of slides and I'm just gonna try to like go through pretty quickly. Um, this is a picture um, called Pollard Birches by Vincent Van Gogh. And this is a, uh, my parents were opera singers uh, in the 60s and 70s. And our house was always filled with music but not a lot of art artwork. And this is um, a piece that they, the story behind this piece was that they were down to like their last hundred dollars when they were in grad school or something. And they bought this piece uh, because it spoke to them in some way. And for me, this piece um, re represents my parents' relationship to art, to art, both music and visual art. And, um, they ended up changing careers um, shortly before they had had me in the in the early seventies, um, and there seems to be at least for me there's this wistful relationship to art in all its forms in 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 our house in my parents' house. Um, my dad was a social work professor at Western Michigan University, um, and we always had some type of computer in our house. Uh, usually it was like the cheapest, the cheapest computer you could get at the time. Uh, and I think because of that early introduction of technology, I don't really feel, um, I feel like technology is a tool in everything that I do in my studio practice. This is my first uh, ceramics teacher, Ed Harkness. Um, and Ed was really a a potter who made incredibly delicate porcelain vessels, but um, also made sculpture. So even from a, a beginning stage, I was 
I felt like I could make pots and I could also like, I could also make sculpture and those things could really go hand in hand with each other. Um, shortly after I left uh, my undergrad degree, I, I got really into um, architecture and design. And this was one of the early pieces that really inspired me. This is George Nakashima's long chair. Um, and uh, fortunately, I have some friends that were a, uh, work for Wright Auctions in Chicago. And Wright is uh, one of the premier auction houses in the country that deal in um, modern art and furniture, mostly furniture. Um, and so every time I went to Chicago, I would, uh, I would go and visit this warehouse and kind of like touch everything and sit on everything. And uh, they always seem to have like really rare ceramic objects. And so I got to kind of like be close to those things. Um, so this is uh, my friend, Michael Jefferson on the right with a Lisa McVeigh coil vessel. Uh, in 2003, I, uh, I moved to Cincinnati with my, with my first wife, and I worked at the Cincinnati Public Library. Um, and the, Cincinnati was an incredible incubator for kind of uh, nurturing this um, kind of my affinity for craft, art, uh, and design. And this is the Cincinnati Museum Center, which is one of the preeminent examples of Art Deco architecture. Uh, and this is Zaha Hadid's uh, first US uh, project. This is the Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art, which was like, a, I think it was like a block away from the museum or from the, uh, from the public library. So I would, every day I would like interact with this building um, and it had a, a real effect on the, what I was thinking about in, this, uh, uh, in regards to ceramics. So this is a early ceramics piece that I made in Cincinnati. And there's some obvious architectural influences happening there. And this is quite small. So I moved back to uh, Kalamazoo and I worked at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts for several years. Um, they have a gigantic ceramics facility. They have offsite, um, uh, an offsite onagama kiln and everything. You could do everything there that you really wanted to do with ceramics. So it was really a, a gift to be able to, to work there. So this is an early Raku jar that I made. This is probably about two, 2004 or five. And this is a teapot. And I was, I was working at the time to um, kind of figure out surfaces. And I was doing a lot of low fire work. And this is a low, all low fire um, with under glazes and, and um, stencils. So these are some folks that I was looking at uh, really early on. I really like uh, John Middlemiss a lot. Um, He's kind of, he comes up a lot in my research and um, he actually reached out to me on the internet because I'd made, I made a blog post about him and apparently I spelled his name wrong and I was just like, so like, oh, John Middlemiss, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, incredible stuff. So here's some, uh, here's another piece that I made um, around that time, just prior to going to graduate school. And this is laser print decals and luster. Uh, and in 2009, I had a chance to go back to, to Germany, which was like my, I think it was my third trip back to Europe. And um, at this time I was really looking at architecture a lot. And this is Daniel Liebeskin's Jewish Museum in Berlin. And this is a model of it. And this is the, the actual model. Um, and so I had this, this structure had a profound effect on me. And at the end of the tour through the, through the um, museum, you, you stop in this um, space that's called the Holocaust Tower. 
and it's a completely silent and, and totally dark except for this one like opening at the top and it made me realize that um the power of contemporary architecture um that spaces can really affect uh the way that you think about the world. And um, I, I really wanted to begin to Im imbue my, my ceramic work with the same type of idea because they're both, you know, it's experiential art, right? So like um, the way that you hold a cup and interact with a, with a cup or a vessel or, or, or really any piece of functional ceramic work um, can have the same, the same effect, right? Um, so this is uh, Michigan State University where I did my grad degree, and um, this is Aha Hadid's second U.S. project. And I, I mean, I feel I felt super fortunate just to be around this thing. So when I started my grad degree, it was a concrete pad, and I and I saw this museum be, um, built over the the next three years, and it was and then I was able to have my um, thesis work. Um, exhibited in it at the end of my degree. So it was really, it was quite nice. These are um, the professors at Michigan State. And this is some early grad work, uh, which did not go over very well in my critiques. And I decided to um, switch to sculpture, sculpture vessels. And so this is a early 3D printed um, uh, piece that I, I made like, um, I made molds for and I slip cast it and I was also teaching woodworking at the time so I was this is a combination of those early pieces. I went back to Germany for a research trip and I went to I visited um, several places here. Um, the bottom right is a uh, mice and porcelain factory which was uh, really incredible to see the artisans working on 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 these pieces these super ornate pieces. This is the Bauhaus uh, in Dessau. And this is a museum, uh, an ex exhibit of Marcel Breuer uh, architectural models. And um, this had a profound effect on my research. And when I came back to uh, the States, I started to make this type of work. And I basically built like a library of molds and just started to um, put things together. It was a very quick process. Um, and these were kind of the finished pieces from that. So um, virtually all through grad school, I was really working on sculpture. Um, I still work on sculpture, like that's the other half of my practice. Um, I do a lot of woodworking. I think a lot about um, design and design history uh and this is um one of my major influences this is jorge pardo and pardo is a architect sculptor and painter amongst other things um you you, you could argue like he's a lighting designer he does a gazillion things so i had a critique with him and he said that i should um make work, I should build rooms for my ceramic pieces. And so I, I started to do these types of things with plexiglass and the plexiglass became the, the room. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through this a little bit faster. This is my thesis exhibition in the Broad Museum. Um, after grad school, I went to ba the Banff Center in Banff, Alberta, um, and I did a Kickstarter campaign to fund the trip. And thankfully, I already I like drove across the country and went there as the Kickstarter campaign was going. And and thankfully, it was funded because I don't know I don't know exactly how, what else I would have done um, besides just put everything on my credit card. So this is um, that's Banff Center. So the bottom left is where the uh, that's the art building. It was super beautiful. So I, uh, I just, I had a quota. I made a certain number of sculptures at Banff Center. I packed them up. Um, and then I went to another residency at Anderson Ranch Art Center. 
here in Snowmass Village. And Doug K. Spears on the left. And that's that that was his studio when I was there. And then Chucho is in the middle. He's the the former Anderson Ranch mascot, and then um, Snowmass Village on the right. Uh, and then I was going to my next residency to South Korea um, at uh, Clay Arch Gamai Museum. And uh, I had a proposal accepted and it was gonna be four months long. And um, I got an email to come down and teach some ceramics classes at the University of Alabama. And so I came down instead of going to this residency. And I, I really wanted to be back in academia I was not prepared for this and it is uh this is like every saturday <laughs> down here and i thought michigan state was like a football school but this is like it's like another level it's on another level down here and this is my wife uh and stepdaughter uh and and clara and clara is actually she's like 12 right now and she and they're like the same height it's nuts um, so this is some work that I finished at uh, when I first came to Alabama. And this is a large uh, porcelain tile piece. And this is a show that I curated. I um, actually organized at Anderson Ranch Art Center. And this is the piece that was in that. This was also at NSICA, I think in 2017. But the, the ceramic piece um, was made at Banff Center. Um, this was made shortly after that. This is uh, called Bedside Pacifier Table. Um, so I uh, was awarded the uh, NSEEK Emerging Artist Award in 2018. Um, and I also organized an exhibition at that time called Parallel Collision. And this is the piece that I designed for that, um, that exhibition. And this is the finished piece here. Um, and it was in a small exhibition kind of far away from the convention center, but um, I, don't, I think it was really successful. We were, we were right next to um, some grads uh, from Alfred and we got a ton of traffic and it was really, it was good. I mean, the feedback was really good. Um, so here's another piece that's kind of in the vein of that, of the, um, the piece that was at Nsika. So I'm doing a lot with, um, you know, woodworking in combination with ceramics and plexiglass and digital, digital and, and the handmade. Um, and I was featured in um, American Craft Magazine in 2018. And here's some new work. So this was uh, when I was hired as the tenure track uh, ceramics professor, I started to work uh, on these pieces um, and completed them over a summer. And these have kind of been um, sent around. They've been shown quite a bit at this point. Um, not really going to go too far into these, but this started to open some doors into, into what I was doing with, um, vessel making. And, uh, I, I've started with, with just these cups, cup forms and everything is, uh, the, the original is printed in plastic. Uh, and I'm extremely lazy with my mold making, <laughs> to be quite honest. I, I really have, uh, I don't have the patience for it. And so what I would, what I did was I, I printed this piece, uh, out of plastic. I glued it to a piece of melamine. I put coddling boards around it and I poured, uh, plaster over it. And uh, I took it to a bandsaw and I cut it up into pieces and it works. <laughs> and uh, so this is actually coming from a four part mold. Um, and what I really like about the, the functional cup forms um, is that they, they allow me to experiment very quickly with 
um, form and color and pattern. Um, very, it's a, it's a kind of a quick study for things that may come or may um, inform sculpture later. Um, so these pieces were just made recently and um, we're in a show called Vase at Alma's RVA in Richmond, Virginia. And these are pretty small. They're, um, I think the widest dimension is probably eight inches. And this is all, um, so I, this is like a two part mold or a base mold and then the, the mold for the body. And the pattern just comes from um, like a, a, it's actually drywall tape that's adhesive. And I just cut it up into, into these shapes and, and put them on the faces of, um, of these vases. And it's all underglazed with just a uh, clear. The inside is a satin mat, a uh, satin black. So here's some wall pieces that I've been working on um, that are kind of making their way around. I just had a solo exhibition at Auburn University uh, in Auburn, Alabama. Um, this was a piece from the small, um, small favor show at Clay Studio. And uh, happily, I've been accepted to a residency at um, the Center for Ceramics in Berlin for the month of May. And so I'll be heading, heading there, um, which will be great. It's my, I haven't been to, to Europe in, since like 2012, so it'll be really nice to get back there. And this is, uh, this is it. That's my last piece. This is a wall hanging. And this is just, this is all, uh, I do a lot with press molds and the surface of this is uh, cut paper and spray paint. And the entire thing is embedded into um, resin. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Wade. Um, we're going to uh, hear from Jennifer Rossiter now, please. Okay. Okay, everybody got me? Yeah, you're good, yeah. thank you, Jennifer. Okay, so um, my name is Jennifer Rossiter. I am a ceramic artist, a graphic designer, and a painter. And I also uh, am from Michigan, from the Lansing area. Uh, we currently live in St. Petersburg, Florida. We moved here about a year ago, and I have a studio at the Morian Center for Clay, which actually sounds very similar to the Clay Art Center. Um, we have artists in residence. We have uh, a lot of ceramic artists who work from that studio, so there's a great exchange of ideas, which I really love, and um, it's also a teaching facility. Um, I actually, I've been doing art for my entire life, but I only came to Clay about four years ago. So um, I'm gonna tell you about how I came to Clay before I start talking about the Clay. My educational background is in uh, graphic design and illustration. I graduated with an illustration major from the Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I went right to work for um, an advertising agency as a designer. So I spent my entire career working in graphic design and um, as a designer and then an art director, I spent a short time as a children's illustrator and eventually to running my own firm. And about um, six years ago, I realized I had not picked up a paintbrush in 25 years. I, you know, was busy working when I had, when I needed um, art, I hired somebody to do it. I just didn't have time. So all of a sudden 
you know, I realized, wow, I'm really far away from that. Um, and I had an old college roommate who um, was encouraging me to start painting again. And she said, um, just pick something. It doesn't matter what it is and paint it a hundred times. You'll, you'll find your voice. So I did that. Um, I happened to be in the grocery store when I was talking to her and I bought uh, pears from the produce section and I just started um, painting. And uh, actually 115 pairs later, I found myself in a couple of gallery shows and I was still painting. Um, I had a lot of my family came. My family is spread out across the entire country. A lot of my family came to support me. And um, that is really what brought me to ceramics. I thought it would be fun to try a ceramics class. And um, in uh, where, where I was living, I landed in a very, very small um, community education class in East Lansing, Michigan. Um, there, there was a maximum of eight people in a class. And I had two uh, very amazing instructors, Lane Kaufman, who, as it turns out, was in the same um, graduate program, ceramics program at Michigan State as Wade, and um, Charlotte Grenier. And uh, I know I have some people from my class here tonight, at least one, um, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Um, that's one of the things about ceramics is you wind up in this, you know, wonderful community of people. And even though I'm not in Michigan anymore, I still stay in touch with the ceramics people that I was with there. Such a, you know, really a great community. So I was there for about two years and um, I was taking throwing classes and I started making plates. So I was um, illustrating and carving these plates using mostly under glazes and some selective glazing. Um, and I pretty much just, you know, went about my merry way and did my plates. And eventually it occurred to me that all of these years of not painting were really just pouring out from me um, onto everything else that I was doing. I, I really, I could not help it. I could not not put imagery on a clay surface that was in front of me. I just couldn't do it. And um, along the way, uh, I kept doing plates, but they were getting more complex. And I've been asked, um, how I chose ceramics. Um, and actually, I honestly believe that ceramics chose me. I've been involved in a lot of different kinds of art over the years. Um, but, you know, ceramics, it just is not letting me go. So along the way, I started experimenting with these platters. And really, um, this was a vehicle for me to experiment with texturing and layering. Um, so, you know, because I was new to ceramics, everything was kind of a, uh, a new adventure. And um, I was using these platters to try out things. Um, so I was, uh, I was dragging texture along the clay with tools, like I was using a serrated rib to drag you know, to put texture onto my clay. I was making shapes that I was um, embossing into the clay. I was, um, I was primarily using under glazes. Sometimes I was wiping it back to expose surfaces of the embossed clay. I was um, carving. I was doing uh, Mishima inlay. I was making, um, I was carving linoleum blocks and using those with underglaze as a printing ink 
to essentially um, print on my clay. Um, and I was doing some selective glazing and I was layering all those things on, you know, single platter. So um, there are a, a lot of things going on. And I also started making um, tiles. I had picked up these cast iron gears. They're old farm uh, seed plates, actually. I picked them up at a flea market um, in Michigan. And I, I, when I saw them, I didn't really know what I was gonna do with them, but I just, I really liked the shape and I knew that they would be good for something. And um, after that rolled around in my head for a while, I thought, oh, you know, these would be great frames for um, tiles. So um, I started making tiles and uh, using those um, cast iron uh, gears as uh, frames. And then, you know, I, I'm still making those, but again, along the way, they've gotten more complicated and bigger. So these are also cast iron um, gears that I found at uh, um, Architectural Antiques Place here in Florida. Um, but this tile is about 15 inches across. Um, so, so it's a pretty big tile. And I've also started doing some um, sculptural work. Um, this, uh, these are um, partially thrown, partially slab built. Um, the first one I did, uh, you don't see it pictured here, but it was uh, thrown in altered shape and each exploration is giving me a little bit of knowledge for the next one. Um, so the one on the left uh, is a decanter. The head comes off and um, he has a, like a pitcher spout underneath for pouring. And the one on the right um, actually was intended to be a decanter, but as ceramics goes, things don't always work out as you plan. So the head fused on um, in the firing. And um, so I, um, you know, did some other things after the fact, made some additional, um, leaf shapes that I attached later, um, just, you know, kind of worked, worked the surface more to make it um, become strictly a sculptural piece. And then this one also has um, a platinum luster. I uh, taught myself how to make clay roses. And so the, um, the dinosaur spine um, is all uh, flowers um, and they're glazed with a platinum luster. Uh, and I forgot to mention that um, bear that we saw a minute ago, that large tile is currently at um, a gallery here in St. Petersburg, um, Florida Craft Art. And I think uh, Katie Dietz um, is with us here tonight, the executive director there. So, um, hi, Katie. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit about influence and inspiration. So when I was growing up in Michigan, we lived near the Michigan Ohio border. And um, from third grade to eighth grade, we carpooled with uh, another family. And every Saturday we went to the Toledo Museum of Art. They have a um, pretty awesome youth program and it's still going on there. And um, in that program, you spent a third of the year in galleries. So you walked around with somebody you learned about paintings and you know different artistic movements. Um, and you spent a third of the year doing two-dimensional art, painting, drawing. I learned um, woodblock carving and printing there. Um, and then a third of the year in three-dimensional work like clay. Um, and one of the really awesome things uh, for me as a child was this very extensive Egyptian collection that they have. And I really came to, um, to love this work. I still love it. 
And I think that this was definitely a time of inspiration for me. Um, I love the, the simplistic shapes. Um, I love the stylized forms. And even though these are antiquities, they still feel very modern to me. Um, so, you know, you can imagine as a third grader uh, spending all that this time in this museum and in particular with this Egyptian collection because they had uh, mummies. Um, this uh, statue you see, the third one it is uh, Farah and it is, it is huge. Um, so all those things really, they both creeped me out and they completely captivated me. So I feel those are, those are definitely things that uh, show up in my work today even. And uh, during pre-COVID times, we traveled a lot. So um, these are the kind of images that I would um, capture as we traveled. I'm very attracted to patterns, to color. Um, I like things that are very graphic. Um, I also like things that are painterly and sometimes primitive. And I often refer to these kinds of things, especially for color inspiration, but also sometimes for shapes. And that um, takes me to um, the, the kind of work that I'm working on now, which is what was um, in A Taste of Home. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my process. So um, I definitely bring my graphic design history and my illustration background to my work um, on clay, to the surface of my work. I am, you know, I'm also concerned about uh, form, but um, I think the surface is really where I'm focused. I'm um, doing a lot of painting, I'm um, combining a lot of techniques and I'm layering a lot of things. So with this particular work, I had um, started with this leaf and floral motif on the left. I had um, done this art and I wanted to put it on um, these vegetable steamers um, that you see on the right. And, um, you know, I was just seeing these as kind of one-off things. And so I just um, redrew my art essentially on the surface of these pots and um, I painted it in my hand. The top one is uh, slip, the bottom one is under glaze. And, um, and then I thought that this could be kind of a cool thing on cups. And I just kind of let that roll around in my head for a while. And um, I was in the garage one day and it occurred to me that I could do something fun with handles on cups. And that's actually the drawing that you see on the left that's on a paper towel. I was in the garage, I just drew it on a paper towel. That's kind of how I wind up doing things, whatever happens to be nearest to me. And I stuck that on the wall in the garage and it um, was there for probably three months before I finally got back to it. And um, one of the things that I wanted to accomplish is um, I really wanted to do handles that were integrated with the graphics and the surface on the cup. So I wanted the handles to look like they belong to the cup. I didn't want them just to be something that was kind of an afterthought and was just utilitarian to, um, to pick up the cup, but didn't really feel like it was integrated. Um, so I wanted these to be integrated. And because I was thinking of this in a series, I decided that I would try doing some underglaze transfers. I hadn't done them before. I hadn't had any instruction in them. Um, uh, so I um, printed my drawing to uh, trans a transparency and I um, bought screens and emulsion online and I exposed my um, transfers to the silk screen. 
And then I, uh, you know, tried some different concoctions for making an underglaze that would handle like an ink to go through the screen without bleeding. Um, I researched rice papers and then ultimately I printed, uh, you know, a variety of different colors, both positive and negative onto the rice paper, just to give me some more options when I was making work. And so here um, you'll see on the left, this is the beginning of one of these cups. So I just, um, I was doing an underpainting and um, that it's all under glaze. And I was just really, you know, picking up a brush and going at it. I wasn't, I wasn't planning out or mapping out what this pattern would be. I was just letting that be really uh, spontaneous. And then um, over that underpainting, you'll see in the middle where I put the transfer. This one is positive. Sometimes I do it in a negative and let the pattern come through on the shapes. And I um, am carving on this particular one. I'm just carving out enough to lift the pattern off the background. Uh, sometimes I'll carve into the shape just to um, define and describe it more. And then on the right, um, this one has been uh, glazed and fired. So that is what took me to um, these cups, which were in uh, Taste of Home. So these have the handles on them, same kind of surface. Um, you know, the top one, my underpainting is, you know, handled like uh, watercolor more. The other one is handled like the, um, the slide I just showed you. And then I was exploring, you know, different color combinations, uh, different shapes for the handles. And um, you can see here, I mean, the, these were all, um, these were bisque. So, you know, I was, some of them I was carving out more um, and, you know, again, just experimenting with colors and different patterns in the backgrounds. And some of my friends, as I was doing these, cause I'm uh, posting on my social media, um, they were referring to me as a wild child. And I'm, you know, just because the, the colors are bright and there's a lot of activity in the patterns. And if you know me, um, I'm very much not a wild child, but I do like that um, these can be sort of a wild child outlet. And I loved that name. So um, they, they are my, my wild child series of cups. And I, uh, you know, I post uh, updates all the time. So if you want to follow along and see what I'm doing, um, this is where you can find me. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. That was wonderful. Um, and I think we're going to hear from Claire next. Okay, so this is the, the title of my talk and more referring to like why I do my art, but we'll also have other, I'll also talk about, you know, how I came to do ceramics and a little bit about my background. So I am based in Chicago. Um, strangely enough, I am also from Michigan. I grew up in Kalamazoo and uh, like Wade, my, I also have a parent who is a professor at Western Michigan University. So maybe there's something about Michigan and ceramics. Uh, by day, I am a user experience designer. So I work more on um, websites, usability, 
making anything with the screen usable. There's a lot of design involved, but definitely not the kind of creative freedom that I can have with ceramics. So I, ceramics are near and dear to my heart. I am a ceramics student at Lil Street Art Center. I've been a student since 2016. It's much like the Clay Art Center. Um, it's not solely fo focused on ceramics, but ceramics are, is basically their, their big name thing. It's what they're known for. It's, it's a really great place. And that's me with two of my cups. Okay, inspirations and influences. So I, I absolutely, love nature it calms me down it's i i just i just find wonderment in it and i i it's so just amazing and calming to me that it's it's an inspiration this is a picture i took at um oxbow center for the arts in Saugatuck, michigan i also i just find I just want to, with my work, I want people to kind of stop and just see how amazing nature can be, even in kind of, you know, not, it's not a national park. Like this picture is in my neighborhood in front of Sen, Sen High School. But I saw the sky and I just, that's just amazing. Like that it's, and, you know, part of the larger picture of why I do my work is I think we, sometimes we don't, we don't see nature for it just, how how amazing and what a miracle it is we're i think we're, we're caught up in other things of life or you know money success and like we don't we don't see what's already here on earth and i mean i think that's sort of playing out with our current you know situation with the climate crisis we've ignored what is most valuable which is our planet our surroundings things that have given us so much so i really seek to elevate moments like this in my work. This is a tree that I saw. I, you know, I being a tech person, I worked at home during COVID. I'm still doing that. So I got to take lots and lots of walks. And again, I just started re-noticing just these these amazing patterns, um, the amazing order in nature. Just these these textures are just like if you just really if you look at it, it's it's like how how is that just there? by us and I think I don't know we just forget about how special nature is we don't necessarily haven't really revered nature as a species and again I just want to with my work sort of stop people for a moment to say oh, look at this amazing thing look at all the beautiful drama and colors and textures so as far as inspirations. I mean, I haven't been doing this that long, but I, I did take a trip down to Asheville and I saw um, Akira Satake's studio a couple of years ago. I, I love his stuff. Um, I like that it doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's, it doesn't represent a specific thing. It's not an animal or a plant, yet it does still evoke nature. Like you can see in the textures to me so clearly, that's, that's bark, that's something that's something weathered that is something natural and he just does these really evocative surfaces and and they're simple yet so powerful randy johnson is also another influence i can't say i was looking at his stuff and then did my stuff it was more that i was i was in class with my, my teacher i've taken many classes with um levi astro and he said oh you should look at randy johnson he's doing a kind of layering that you're doing and this yeah this to me looks like fire or some sort of inferno or lava but again to me just evokes the, the power of those natural processes on our planet simon levin is another one where i was he was pointed out to me as somebody's my work was looking a little bit like his he also works in i think in wood firing um and again just this looks just kind of a flame and it's doesn't evoke a specific object yet to me it's it's something natural and organic okay so my process um generally i will throw something although i also do hand build but i, I usually i throw um 
I trim usually. I also apply flashing slips and texture. And that really, I mean, if I do, I've for the past year, I've mostly just been uh, soda firing and if you're a soda firer, um, you know that texture is really important to get on there because then the soda can kind of get in those little cracks and make just more more dramatic work. It's it's more likely to turn out good because soda firing is really kind of a can be a little bit of a crapshoot. So anything you can do to try to make your pieces more likely to turn out good and interesting on most sides is good. So that's that's some thick chino and then I dragged a little serrated rib through it. Okay. For bisque, um, I generally will, after I get it out of the bisque kiln, um, I will rub some mason stain in the texture just to highlight it more. Um, it's a little bit like what Akira Sataki does. I think he, he does it a different way. Um, I think he does a lot of this stuff when it's just leather hard. Um, and yeah, I'll usually wipe off the stain because you don't want too much because it can flux and run all over the place. Uh, I do put on glaze. Some people don't do that with soda fired works and just use the flashing slips. I find the glaze can put in some extra drama and again, more um, likelihood that something will turn out interesting looking. Um, so I've got some, I think some forest green glaze on there and then wood ash, which also just you know, ups the drama factor, kind of make it more um, some really interesting, like rainbow kinds of colors that just I like to I'm, I'm not just kind of a browns and oranges soda firing person. I like to get more colors when possible. OK, so this is this is the finished piece. Um, it's as you can see, it's got pretty dramatic texture. I like it because it's um, just a lot of variation in color. It's not just browns and oranges. Um, you can see the raw clay in there with that kind of warm, um, warm orangey brown hue. I generally use um, bee clay because it does much better in soda, um, the Continental brand. And yeah, I think I was thinking this with this piece, I was thinking of the bark I saw. I really was wanting to get kind of like how that bark wraps around the tree and then put in some of my own just color to up the drama. Okay, so that brings me to my more recent work. In the past, I've done a lot of more um, comb 10 gas firings, but not soda firing or wood firing. So this is my um, soda fired work, fired work. If you want to see my earlier stuff, I will direct you to my Black Cat Pottery Instagram. OK, so here's sort of an, another example of um, just kind of that nature coming out in my work. I can't say I planned this out to look like this galaxy, but it looks so much like it. It just kind of shocks me. And I'm like, okay, this is cosmic. Like this is this, I don't feel that you can achieve this in with in a non-soda firing process. I mean, this sort of natural, spontaneous, organic, um, somewhat unintentional effect that just to me evokes the wonder and the miracle of nature is something I've only been able to do with soda firing. This is another example of a, of a cup I made. Again, I it seems kind of cosmic to me. It's got a lot of colors, sort of some more kind of X patterns in there, some texture. The little granules in there are silica sand that I mixed into the clay for some extra kind of little star sparkle and texture. This is another, this is a picture that really looks like a, a sunset to me. Um, it's just, I find it really interesting how these things come out and it's, you know, they come from me and I love nature, but I didn't necessarily, I don't, I don't plan it logically like painting a picture. Sometimes these things just, just come out. This I'm kind of gravitating more towards having that kind of organic sort of path of the flame surface, but then a more planned design. So having sort of like 
the, the background of the painting and then the foreground of the design with the, the background showing through. And this to me reminds me of lava or some sort of fire or perhaps a wildfire or a fire tornado if we're talking about present times. Uh, so just, I, again, I really like the drama of the colors I'm able to get in these types of firings. This one is again, very fiery, very warm, very intense, but also some little bit, some geometric elements in there. And that is, I think it's like just the bare clay and some orange slip and some black mason stain. And again, very, very heavy texture for the, for the soda to nestle in there. This jar, no, Again, it's pretty intense texture. I, what I, another thing I love about soda is you can look at three sides or however many sides of an object and they're completely different. They can, I mean, they're, it's not, it's not uniform. It's, you can, it's good almost, you can see a completely different thing sometimes, which I, I find amazing. I, I originally called this one surface of Mars. Um, I don't know, it's looking a little different to me now, but just the intense reds and that kind of red surface. So another part of it, um, this is both, um, I don't think there's any glaze on here. It's just different flashing slips, the soda, um, some strategically rubbed in black mason stain. Again, we're just getting that kind of organic painterly natural process kind of surface that I just, really gravitate towards. And this is the third side. This looks the most kind of like the surface of Mars to me. It's just that kind of stark, rusty red, you know, middle of nowhere kind of look. Um, so that brings me to Taste of Home. Um, that is my cup on the right. It's, I called it Wild Sunset. It's got a couple different sides. So it's worth looking at all of them if you want to check out the exhibition online. Uh, I submitted to this particular show because of the juror. I know Julia Galloway does does work in soda. I, she's a very established artist. She does you know really good work. So I was honored to have her choose my piece. Also, just the reputation of the Clay Art Center. It's nationally known. It's nonprofit. I it's not in Illinois, so I thought it'd be a really good opportunity. And then. The obvious part, just getting more exposure, being in a national exhibition is pretty exciting for me. And this piece in particular, I think is, it's more, there is not as much of a process with this piece. There's no mason stain. I think it's just some flashing slip. So I think it's some chino, the raw clay, and then maybe like a smooth orange on top. That's all I have. Uh, you can reach me. Uh, online and at my um, Black Cat Pottery account on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, next up, we're going to hear from Heidi. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for having me and I'm so excited to be a part of the show and uh, it's been lovely to hear all of your uh, stories about your work and um, great to keep your company with all the artists in the show, but Jennifer and Claire and Wade, it's so fun to hear about your work. Um, so thanks for sharing. Um, I'm Heidi McKay Casto and um, I live here in Iowa City, Iowa. Um, I was born in Pennsylvania and raised in Ohio, and I went to uh, Ohio State for my undergrad where I got my BFA, and I went to the University of Iowa for my MFA. Um, and after a series of handfuls of moves, I uh, ended up back here in Iowa City where I teach at the University of Iowa. and. Uh, work in my home studio garage here. Um, 
Throughout my career, um, I've kind of teetered back and forth between the conceptual drawl of sculptural forms and that intimacy that, uh, of pottery. There's a way in which the rhythm of the wheel and like the movement of my body create a dance that kind of connects me beyond the mental or emotional process of my work and into that physical realm. As I touch and work the clay lovingly through each stage of labor and rhythm, I'm drawn to like wonder about the life that these objects will have beyond my studio and beyond my hands into someone else's hands. Like who will create cradle this pot next in their hands? Um, what will they stir into it? What will they drink from it? What stories will they hear? What tears will this cup catch? What smile will it give someone? What laughter will it echo? I was so drawn to this show, A Taste of Home because of its moment. Um, in the pandemic. And um, uh, it's just, I believe home has really transformed a lot during this time. It's on, home has taken on a new form, um, giving us a new relationship with our surroundings and the closeness to the people that we have, you know, shared that space with. Um, so the two pieces um, in the show, were inspired by my own personal navigation around home and creativity within the kitchen during the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, despite my tendency to be a bit of an introvert, I loved hosting gatherings and creating spaces uh, for people to connect over food. And it's been a real loss for my soul to have the absence of that during the pandemic shutdown and uh, staying indoors more. Um, let's see, this piece, Homemaker, was inspired by my mom, who seems to be able to magically create like a 12 course meal out of just tomatoes and rice. <laughs> um, but we weren't able to visit much, uh, actually, for a really long time um, at the beginning. And um, sharing our kitchen creations through text and Zoom was a way that we were really able to like share our homes with each other. Balance of responsibility is uh, more of a humorous snapshot of that post-dinner mess and my husband's obliviousness to it. Um, it very much perplexed me that he could just relaxingly grab his guitar and strum away while this mess sat a few feet away from him. To his credit, he's super willing to help uh, when he's asked, but the balance of responsibility really came under the magnifying glass really fast uh, when we were hibernating in the same space. I use, um, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> I use the personification of animals uh, to kind of soften that awkwardness and vulnerability of human interactions. I think about uh, the, how instincts uh, really drive animal behavior while our instincts as humans are kind of clouded by insecurity and guilt, shame and embarrassment, emotions that don't guide animals' behavior at all, nor do they really even have the capacity to feel. As a mother, woman, partner, just a 40-year-old human, I'm often kind of digging through those the grittiness of all of those emotions just to quiet it down and hear and feel those natural instincts. As I continue to explore uh, those concepts of human emotion and instinct juxtaposed with everyday life and personal experiences, I'm starting to experiment with the idea of that sculptural coming back to my work a little bit, the sculptural meeting my throne forms as an expanded canvas for these stories. Um, I throw my main form here, as you can see, and I keep it rather simple. And then once my cups have dried a bit, I reshape the walls, as you can see on the right, and uh, I give it a little bit of more of a gestural movement. And then 
using a slab, I build what I call my handles, but it's kind of the sculptural form on the side uh, of my pieces to expand uh, the canvas. And I try to keep the process very loose and unplanned at this time. I'm not planning out what these objects are gonna be or what imagery is gonna go on here. I'm just having fun with shapes. Um, and then I kind of combine the two, I, I get those shapes all together. I have a set of shapes next to me and then I get my cups out. Um, so then I play around with uh, what shape looks best on each cup. And um, it's kind of like, you know, designing your outfit and doing a puzzle at the same time. Um, it's, it's just really fun to, to play around with what fits. Um, so once these pieces are bisked and assembled um, and they come together to be one blank canvas, you can see a couple more refined after a couple of days. These, these ones on the bottom right are kind of the rough draft. I, there's still a lot of uh, smoothing that has to happen to those ones. Um, porcelain will teach you patience. <laughs> so those, those are sitting for a while. Um, so then I, um, I really sit with those pieces um, and I imagine the story forming on the surface. I created a puzzle for myself that I have to solve now. So it's a lot like playing that cloud game where you're asking yourself, like, what do you see here? What, what shape? And so I draw from these ideas of my life and thoughts and sketches and readings and observations about both human and animal species. And then that story starts to come to life on the surface. So you can see uh, from a sketch idea of mm, the awkwardness of what play dates can feel like sometimes to the drawing on the surface of a bisque piece to what that finished piece looks like. Once, um, once I get that map out, um, with pencil on my bisque ware, I go over it with black underglaze and then I bring my stroke and coats in and add the colors. And then when I'm all done with the surface design, I put a clear glaze on, on the piece. And then here is uh, what one of those more recent sculptural cups looks like in the round. They're, they're not easy to photograph, but they're, I just love the humor and the awkwardness that it brings to that experience of actually holding and um, being intimate with a piece of pottery. Um, I've also been in some recent shows with these new sculptural forms. Um, these, I was an invited artist for um, Charlie Cummings' most recent uh, cup, The Intimate Object, and um, these were two pieces that were in that show. And um, I was also in Red Lodge Clay Center's Jury National Six. And um, still happening Strictly Functional Pottery National. So thank you so much for listening and learning a little bit more about my work. Um, if you want to follow me, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Heidi McKay designs and um, check out my website if you want any more information. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heidi. And uh, thanks to everybody for uh, sharing so uh, deeply with us tonight. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. I hope you enjoyed uh, hearing from our artists. And uh, thank you to our artists, not just for being with us tonight, but for submitting to the exhibition and for participating. Um, people have really enjoyed your work and uh, we hope to have more of your work at Clay Arts Centre. Thank you all for joining us. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you.